Hello, children. Uncle Charles here again with another dread time story for you. We all tucked up comfortably, feet up and under the covers away from whatever lurks beneath the bed. Excellent. Then we'll begin. And tonight's tale is entitled The Thing on the Roof by Robert E. Howard. Let me begin by saying that I was surprised when Tussman called on me. We had never been close friends. The man's mercenary instincts repelled me, and since our bitter controversy of three years before, when he attempted to discredit my evidences of Nahua culture in Yucatan, which was the result of years of careful research, our relations had been anything but cordial. However, I received him and found his manner hasty and abrupt but rather abstracted, as if his dislike for me had been thrust aside in some driving passion that had hold of him. His errand was quickly stated. He wished my aid in obtaining a volume of the first edition of von Junst's Nameless Cults, the edition known as the Black Book, not from its colour, but because of its dark contents. He might almost as well have asked me for the original Greek translation of the Necronomicon though since my return from Yucatan I had devoted practically all my time to my avocation of book collecting, I had not stumbled onto any hint that the book in the Dusseldorf edition was still in existence. A word as to this rare work, its extreme ambiguity in spots, coupled with its incredible subject matter, has caused it long to be regarded as the ravings of a maniac, and the author was damned with the brand of insanity. But the fact remains that many of his assertions are unanswerable, and that he spent the full 45 years of his life prying into strange places and discovering secret and abysmal things. Not a great many volumes were printed in the first edition, and many of these were burned by their frightened owners when von Juntz was found strangled in a mysterious manner in his barred and bolted chamber one night in 1840, six months after he had returned from a mysterious journey to Mongolia. Five years later, a London printer, one Bridewell, pirated the work and issued a cheap translation for, for sensational effect, full of grotesque woodcuts and riddled with misspellings, faulty translations, and the usual errors of a cheap and unscholarly printing. This still further discredited the original work, and publishers and public forgot about the book until 1909, when the Golden Goblin Press of New York brought out an edition. Their production was so carefully expurgated that fully a fourth of the original matter was cut out. The book was handsomely bound and decorated with the exquisite and weirdly imaginative illustrations of Diego, Diego Vazquez. The edition was intended for popular consumption, but the artistic instinct of the publishers defeated that end, since the cost of issuing the book was so great that they were forced to cite it at a prohibitive price. I was explaining all of this to Hussman when he interrupted brusquely to say that he was not utterly ignorant of such matters. One of the Golden Goblin books ornamented his library, he said, and it was in it that he found a certain line which aroused his interests. If I could procure him a copy of the original 1839 edition, he would make it worth my while, knowing, he added, that it would be useless to offer me money. He would instead, in return for my trouble on his behalf, make a full retraction of his former accusations in regard to my Yucatan researchers and offer a complete apology in the scientific news. I will admit that I was astounded at this and realized that if the matter meant so much to Tasman that he was willing to make such concessions, it must indeed be of the utmost importance. I answered that I considered that I had sufficiently refuted his charges in the eyes of the world and had no desire to put him in a humiliating position, but that I would make the utmost efforts to procure him what he wanted. He thanked me abruptly and took his leave, saying rather vaguely he hoped to find a complete exposition of something in the black book which had evidently been slighted in the later edition. I set to work writing letters to friends, colleagues and book dealers all over the world and soon discovered I had assumed a task of no small magnitude. Three months elapsed before my efforts were crowned with success, but at last, through the aid of Professor James Clement of Richmond, Virginia, I was able to obtain what I wished. I notified Tusman, and he came to London by the next train. His eyes burned avidly as he gazed at the thick, dusty volume with its heavily bound covers and rusty iron clasp, and his fingers quivered with eagerness as he thumbed the time-yellowed pages. 
And when he cried out fiercely and smashed his clenched fist bound upon the table, I knew that he had found what he hunted. Listen, he commanded, and he read to me a passage that spoke of an old, old temple in the Honduras jungle where a strange god was worshipped by an ancient tribe which became extinct before the coming of the Spaniards. And Tusman read aloud of the mummy that had in life been the last high priest of that vanished people, and which now lay in a chamber hewn in the solid rock of the cliff against which the temple was built. About that mummy's withered neck was a copper chain, and on that chain a great red jewel carved in the form of a toad. This jewel was the key, von Jonst went to say, to the treasure of the temple, which lay hidden in the subterranean crypt far below the temple's altar. Tusman's eyes blazed. I have seen that temple. I have stood before the altar. I have seen the sealed up entrance of the chamber in which the natives say lies the mummy of the priest. It is a very curious temple, no more like the ruins of the prehistoric Indians than it is like the buildings of the modern Latin Americans. The Indians in the vicinity disclaim any former connection with the place. They say that the people who built the temple were a different race from themselves and were there when their own ancestors came to the country. I believe it to be a remnant of some long-vanished civilization which began to decay thousands of years before the Spaniards came. I would have liked to have broken into the sealed-up chamber, but I had neither the time nor the tools for the task. I was hurrying to the coast, having been wounded by an accidental gunshot in the foot, and I stumbled onto the place purely by chance. I have been planning to have another look at it, but circumstances have prevented. Now I intend to let nothing stand in my way. By chance, I came upon a passage in the Golden Goblin edition of this book describing the temple, but that was all. The mummy was only briefly mentioned. Interested, I obtained one of Bridewell's translations, but he ran up against a blank wall of baffling blunders. By some irritating mischance, the translator had even mistaken the location of the Temple of the Toad, as John von Yunz calls it, and has it in Guatemala instead of Honduras. The general description is faulty. The jewel is mentioned, and the fact that it is a key but a key to what, Bride, Wells' book does not state. I now felt that I was on the track of a real discovery, unless von Junst was, as many maintain, a madman. But that the man was actually in Honduras at one time is well attested, and no one could be so vividly describe the temple as he does in the Black Book, unless he had seen it himself. How he learned of the jewel is more than I can say. The Indians who told me of the mummy said nothing of any jewel. I can only believe that von Junst found his way into the steel crypt somehow. The man had uncanny ways of learning hidden things. To the best of my knowledge, only one other white man has seen the Temple of the Toad, besides von Junst and myself, the Spanish traveller Juan González, who made a partial exploration of that country in 1793. He mentioned briefly a curious fane that differed from most Indian ruins, and spoke sceptically of a legend current among the natives that there was something unusual hidden under the temple. I feel certain that he was referring to the Temple of the Toad. Tomorrow I sail for Central America. Keep the books, I have no more use for it. This time I am going fully prepared. I intend to find what is hidden in that temple if I have to demolish it. It can be nothing less than the Great Stone of Gold. The Spaniards missed it somehow. When they arrived in Central America, the Temple of the Toad was deserted. They were searching for living Indians from whom torture could wring gold. Not for mummies of lost peoples. But I mean to have that treasure. So saying, Tusman took his departure. I sat down and opened the book at the place where he left off reading, and I sat until midnight, wrapped in von Junt's curious, wild, and at times utterly vague expoundings. And I found, pertaining to the Temple of the Toad, certain things which disquieted me so much that the next morning I attempted to get in touch with Tusman, only to find that he had already sailed. Several months passed. And then I received a letter from Tusman asking me to come and spend a few days with him at his estate in Sussex. He also requested me to bring the black book with me. I arrived at Tusman's rather isolated estate just after nightfall. He lived in almost feudal state, his great ivy-grown house and broad lawn surrounded by high stone walls. As I went up the hedge-bordered way from the gate in the home, I noticed that the place had not been well kept in its master's absence. Weeds grew rank among the trees, almost choking out the grass. Amongst an unkempt bushes over or against the outer wall, I heard what appeared to be a horse or an ox blundering and lumbering about. I distinctly heard the clink of its hoof on a stone. 
A servant who eyed me suspiciously admitted me, and I found Tusman pacing to and fro in his study like a caged lion. His giant frame was leaner, harder than when I had last seen him. His face was bronzed by a tropic sun. There were more and harsher lines in his strong face, and his eyes burned more intensely than ever. A smouldering, baffled anger seemed to underlie his manner. Well, Tusman, I greeted him. What success? Did you find the gold? I found not an ounce of gold, he growled. The whole thing was a hoax. Well, not all of it. I broke into the sealed chamber and found the mummy and the jewel, I exclaimed. He drew something from his pocket and handed it to me. I gazed curiously at the thing I held. It was a great jewel, clear and transparent as crystal, but of a sinister crimson, carved, as von Junster declared, in the shape of a toad. I shuddered involuntarily. The image was peculiarly repulsive. I turned my attention to the heavy and curiously wrought copper chain which supported it. What are these characters carved on the chain? I asked curiously. I cannot say, Tusman replied. I thought perhaps you might know. I find a faint resemblance between them and certain partly defaced hieroglyphics on a monolith known as the Black Stone in the mountains of Hungary. I feel unable to decipher them. Tell me of your trip, I urged, and over our whiskey and sodas, he began, as if with strange reluctance. I found the temple again with no great difficulty, though it lies in a lonely and little frequented region. The temple is built against a sheer stone cliff in a deserted valley unknown to maps and explorers. I would not endeavour to make an estimate of its antiquity, but it is built of a sort of unusually hard basalt, such as I have never seen anywhere else, and its extreme weathering suggests incredible age. Most of the columns which form its facade are in ruins, thrusting up shattered stumps from worn bases, like the scattered and broken teeth of some grinning hag. The outer walls are crumbling, but the inner walls and the columns which support such of the roof will remain intact. Seems good for another thousand years, as well as the walls of the inner chamber. The main chamber is a large circular affair, with a floor composed of great squares of stone. In the centre stands the altar, merely a huge, round, curiously carved block of the same material. Directly behind the altar is the solid stone cliff, which forms the rear wall of the chamber, is the sealed, hewn-out chamber wherein lies the mummy of the temple's last priest. I broke into the crypt with not too much difficulty, and found the mummy exactly as is stated in the Black Book. Although it was in a remarkable state of preservation, I was unable to classify it. The withered features and general contour of the skull suggested certain peoples of Lower Egypt, and I feel certain that the priest was a member of a race more akin to the Caucasian than the Indian. Beyond this, I can make no positive statement. But the jewel was there, the chain looped up about the dried-up neck. From, from this point, Tusman's narrative became so vague that I had some difficulty in following him, and wondered if the tropic sun had affected his mind. He had opened a hidden door in the altar somehow, with the jewel, just how, he did not plainly say, and it struck me that he did not clearly understand himself the action of the jewel key. But the opening of the secret door had had a bad effect on the hardy rogues in his employ. They had refused point-blank to follow him through that gaping black opening, which had appeared so mysteriously when the gem was touched to the altar. Tusman entered alone with his pistol and electric torch, finding a narrow stone stair that wound down into the bowels of the earth, apparently. He followed this and presently came into a broad corridor, in the blackness of which the tiny beam of light was almost engulfed. As he told this, he spoke with strange annoyance of a toad which hopped ahead of him just beyond the circle of light all the time that he was below ground. Making his way along dark tunnels and stairways that were wells of solid blackness, he at last came to a heavy door, fantastically carved, which he felt must be the crypt wherein was secreted the gold of the ancient worshippers. He pressed the toad jewel against it several places, and finally the door gaped open. And the treasure, I broke in eagerly. He laughed in savage self-mockery. There was no gold there. No precious gems, nothing, he hesitated. Nothing that I could bring away. Again his tale lapsed into vagueness. I gathered that he had left the temple rather hurriedly, without searching any further for the supposed treasure. 
He had intended bringing the mummy away with him, he said, to present to some museum. But when he came up out of the pits, it could not be found, and he believed that his men, in superstitious aversion to having such a companion on their road to its coast, had thrown it into some well or cavern. And so, he concluded, I am in England again, no richer than when I left. You have the jewel, I reminded him. Sure, it is valuable. He eyed it without further, with some sort of fierce avidness, almost obsessional. Would you say that it is a ruby? he asked. I shook my head. I am unable to classify it. And I. But let me see the book. He slowly turned the heavy pages, his lips moving as he read. Sometimes he shook his head as if puzzled, and I noticed him dwell long over a certain line. The man dipped so deeply into forbidden things, said he. I cannot wonder that his fate was so strange and mysterious. He must have had some foreboding of his end. Here he warns men not to disturb sleeping things. Husman seemed lost in his thoughts for some moments. Aye, sleeping things, he muttered, that seem dead, but only lie waiting for some blind fool to awaken them. I should have read further in the black book, and I should have shut the door when I left the crypt. But I have the key, and I'll keep it in spite of hell. He roused himself from his reveries and was about to speak when he stopped short. From somewhere upstairs had come a peculiar sound. What was that? He glared at me. I shook my head, and he ran to the door and shouted for a servant. The man entered a few moments later, and he was rather pale. You were upstairs, growled Tussman. Yes, sir. Did you hear anything? asked Tussman harshly, and in a manner almost threatening and accusing. I did, sir, the man answered with a puzzled look on his face. What did you hear? The question was fairly snarled. Well, sir, the man laughed apologetically. You'll say I'm a bit off, I fear, but to tell you the truth, sir, it sounded like a, a horse stamping around on the roof. A blaze of absolute madness leaped into Tussman's eyes. You fool, he screamed. Get out of here. The man shrank back in amazement, and Tussman snatched up the gleaming toad car jewel. I've been a fool, he raved. I didn't read far enough, and I should have shut the door, but by heaven, the key is mine, and I'll keep it in spite of man or devil. And with these strange words, he turned and fled upstairs. A moment later, his door slammed heavily, and a servant, knocking timidly, brought forth only a blasphemous order to retire and a luridly worded threat to shoot anyone who tried to obtain entrance to the room. Had it not been so late, I would have left the house, for I was certain that Tussman was stark mad. As it was, I retired to the room a frightened servant showed me, but I did not go to bed. I opened the pages of the black book at the place where Tussman had been reading. This much was evident, unless the man was utterly insane. He had stumbled upon something unexpected in the Temple of the Toad. Something unnatural about the opening of the altar door had frightened his men, and in the subterraneous crypt Tussman had found something that he had not thought to find. And I believed that he had been followed from Central America, and that the reason for his persecution was the jewel he called the key. Seeking some clue to von Junst's volume, I read again of the Temple of the Toad, of the strange pre-Indian people who worshipped there, and of the huge, tethering, tentacle, hoofed monstrosity they worshipped. Tasman had said that they had not read far enough when he had first seen the book. Puzzling over this cryptic phrase, I came upon the lines he had pored over, marked by his thumbnail. It seemed to me to be another of von Junt's many ambiguities, for it merely stated that a temple's god was the temple's treasure. Then the dark implication of the hint struck me, and cold sweat beaded my forehead. The key to the treasure, and the temple's treasure was the temple's god, and sleeping things might awaken on the opening of the prison door. I sprang up, unnerved by the intolerable suggestion, and at that moment something crashed in the stillness, and the death scream of a human being burst upon my ears. In an instant I was out of the room, and as I dashed up the stairs I heard sounds that have made me doubt my sanity ever since. At Tussman's door I halted, essaying with shaking hand to turn the knob. The door was locked, and as I hesitated I heard from within a hideous, high-pitched tittering, and then the disgusting, squashy sounds, as if a great jelly-like bulk was being forced through the window. The sound ceased, and I could have sworn I heard a faint swish of gigantic wings. Then silence. 
Gathering my shattered nerves, I broke down the door. A foul and overpowering stench billowed out like a yellow mist. Gasping in nausea, I entered. The room was in ruins, but nothing was missing except the crimson toad cave carved jewel Tusman called the key, and that was never found. A foul, unspeakable slime smeared the window sill, and in the centre of the room lay Tusman, his head crushed and flattened, and on the red ruin of skull and face, the plain print of an enormous hoof. Good night.